we'll get started. So we have been talking about maximum principle and dynamic programming so far. Uh, the goal for today's class is to apply dynamic programming method to solve a couple of problems. Uh, the first one is going to be the LQR problem. It's also part of your homework. And the second one is about resource allocation problem, which is about allocating, uh, allocating scarce resource over long periods of time. So let's look at the LQR problem. Linear quadratic regulator problem. So here, xt plus 1 is axt plus but, and then the cost is, this is the running cost, which is This kind of problem appears in tracking in control systems. This is equal to uh, x Okay, so we have set up the dynamic problem. We have the state transition function, how the state evolves over time as a function of current state and the current action. And then we have a running cost, which tells you how much cost are we paying at every point of time as a function of the state and action. And then we have a terminal cost, which tells us what's the cost at the terminal time step as a function of state at the terminal time step. What are the two ways by which I can solve this problem? I want to optimize, I want to come up with the optimal sequence of actions or strategies. What should we do? What have we learned so far? When you have a dynamic problem, we can either compute the optimal open loop strategies using Pontryagin maximum principle, or we can compute optimal closed loop strategies using dynamic programming. Okay, so we have two options. One is use PMP, Pontryagin maximum principle, to compute optimal open loop control. Open loop means that the control action ut doesn't depend on xt. Alternatively, I can use dp dynamic programming to compute optimal closed loop policy. Okay, 
The PMP part, which is using PMP to compute open loop, that's part of your homework assignment, assignment six. And uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. So that's why I don't want to do this. It's, it's fairly straightforward. You also have a question where I ask you to use DP to compute the optimal closed loop policy. And I'm just going to give you a couple of equations here, and then you can do the rest of the induction step in your assignment to calculate the optimal closed loop policy. OK. So we'll use DP. OK, we'll use DP, and we want to find the optimal closed loop policy, which means I want to find gamma star, gamma t star, as a function of xt. OK, so what's the step one in dynamic program? We need to define the terminal value function. So I'm going to define vt plus 1 of xt plus 1 as ct plus 1 of xt plus 1 transpose qt plus 1 xt plus 1. That's my terminal value function. Now I have to do, uh, I have to compute two things. I, I want to solve the following problem. Minimum UT in U capital T in RM. XT transpose QXT. UT transpose RUT plus Vt plus 1, Axt plus Bot. Okay, so I have the current running cost plus the future value evaluated at the future state. Okay, this is xt plus 1. So let's expand this vt plus 1 term because I have like some terms inside this parentheses. So let me try to expand that. So this is equal to minimizing ut in rm xt transpose qxt
ओके एनी क्वेश्चन सो फार ओके सो वी हैव द रनिंग कॉस्ट वी हैव द टर्मिनल कॉस्ट इवेल्युएटेड एट द नेक्स्ट स्टेट आई गेट सम कॉम्प्लिकेटेड एक्सप्रेशन नाउ आई वांट टू क्रिएट अ सिंपलर एक्सप्रेशन सो दैट आई कैन कंप्यूट इट इजीली सो आई जस्ट आई जस्ट गॉटन ऑल द टर्म्स टुगेदर सो एक्स टी ट्रांसपोज मेट्रिक्स एक्स टी टर्म दैट्स टुगेदर यू टी ट्रांसपोज सम मेट्रिक्स यू टी टर्म दैट्स टुगेदर एंड देन आई हैव दिस cross term between xt and ut oh i didn't mention but q is positive definite and r is positive definite please make that note while formulating the problem so q is positive semi definite r is positive definite now what kind of function is this as a function of ut remember this minimization problem is over ut so i want to know what is the what does this function looks like as a function of ut do you think it's a convex function hmm why is it a convex function as a function of ut it's a quadratic form it's in the quadratic form and this is positive definite what about this term this is positive semi definite so b transpose qt plus 1b this is positive semi definite so i added a positive definite matrix to a positive semi definite matrix i get a positive definite matrix so this is actually strictly convex in ut this is linear in ut so i don't care about it this is quadratic in ut with a positive semi definite matrix positive definite matrix here so it's convex in ut so how do i solve for an optimal solution i just differentiate and set it equal to 0 so differentiating with respect to ut we get r plus b transpose qt plus 1b ut plus no there should be 2 here and 2 b transpose qt plus 1a xt equals to 0 u star t that's at the optimal solution Okay, so the derivative of with respect to so I'm differentiating with respect to ut. This term doesn't depend on ut, so the derivative is zero. This one has two ut, one on this side and one on the other side. So I have to do. Uh, I have to assume that this ut is constant, and then differentiate with respect to this ut, and then assume that this ut is constant. Differentiate with respect to this ut. So I have two such differentiations. and therefore i have two term two 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 here and then i have the usual term r plus b transpose qb and then in this case i only have to differentiate once with respect to this ut so i get the rest of the term right here now i can solve this fairly easily because this is positive definite matrix this is u star t this is something that depends on xt so i can 
solve this and I get u star t, which is gamma star, sorry, capital T, gamma star capital T of xt is B transpose minus inverse qt plus 1 op transpose. Okay. So what kind of linear, uh, what kind of uh, strategy do I get as a function of xt? Well, there is some matrix. This is a matrix. Let me call this kt. And that matrix gets multiplied to xt. And that gives me the optimal action. Okay. So in this case, the optimal policy at time t is actually a linear function of xt. This is one of those rare cases in dynamic optimization where the optimal solution has such a nice form. Okay. For the rest of the semester, we will see that that's not the case in general and that the policies can be a very, very complex function of xt. But in this case, in the linear quadratic problem, it's actually a linear function of xt. Optimal policy is linear function in xt. Now notice another thing, all of these are problem parameters, Q, A, B, Q, R, and this QT plus one, these are all problem parameters. Let's look at the expression for KT, okay? Do you think it's a difficult expression to compute once you know the problem parameters? No, right? So this is some matrix multiplication, then matrix inverse can be done. So 10 cross 10, if, if, if R is 10 cross 10 or 15 cross 15, you can do the matrix inversion pretty easily. Uh, this is some matrix multiplication, not complicated. So computation of KT is actually not complicated at all. And in fact, you can write a small code in, in, on Raspberry Pi, which can compute this optimal solution fairly easily. Okay, so on embedded devices, it's very easy to implement this particular solution because uh, once you know the matrices, then computing KT is not that complicated. But remember in dynamic program, we are not just interested in computing the optimal policy, we also have to compute the optimal value function. So now what I have to do is substitute the value of this u star t, this, this, this ugly expression, back into this equation to compute the, the value function v star, sorry, not v star, but vt, v capital T. So let me do that. So my vt of xt would be this with ut replaced with u star t. Okay, so I've computed the minimizing value, sorry, uh, the, the optimal solution which is u star t. I substitute it back into this expression, running co cost plus terminal cost and then substitute u star t and I'll get vt. Uh, 
Now this is going to take a lot of effort, but I'm just going to write down the expression. Remember in the expression for VT, we had like three expressions. So those are the three expressions I've written there. So this is the x transpose xt term. If you go back and look up the expression for the cost function that we were trying to minimize, this is the xt transpose xt term. This is the ut transpose ut term. And this is the cross term between ut and xt, okay? Anything weird, not weird, but anything simplifying in these expressions, something that you notice? It has the same form as the t plus one. Right. So these two are, have the same value, just the coefficients are different. So I'm just going to club these two terms together and I get Vt of xt as xt transpose Pt xt, where Pt is given by A transpose Qt plus one A plus, oh, I have already used P, so let me write it as ST. Plus Q minus A transpose
So we notice a few things here. All of these terms are xt transpose some matrix times xt kind of term. This is a positive semi-definite matrix. This is a positive definite matrix. This is a positive definite matrix. Um, the other thing we notice is that the sec third term is the same as second term, but with different coefficients. So what I can do is I can take out xt transpose on the left side, xt on the right side, and I can compress all of it as a single matrix S capital, capital S sub t, which is given by this particular long expression. Okay. This expression is known as Riccati equation. Okay. R I Riccati equation, which takes as input A, B, R, Q matrices and it provides you with a recursive expression for computing ST. What we also notice here is my terminal cost VT plus 1 was a quadratic function of XT plus 1. My VT is also a quadratic function of XT. Okay, so I can essentially go through the same set of expressions and I can compute the expression for S sub small t and then gamma star of small t. Okay, I, because it's, it's the same expression, just the, the numbers have changed. Instead of QT plus one, I now have S capital T. And so everywhere where QT plus one appears, I can change it with S capital T and I get the expression for Vt minus 1 and I can keep doing that again and again and I can get the value function at any time and I can get the, uh, the policy at any point of time. Do you think computing the Riccati equation is a difficult challenge? Not really, you are already computing all of this stuff and you just do a bit more matrix multiplication and you get the value of st and st minus one and so on. So actually, uh, solving this problem on a microcontroller is extremely straightforward. There's no, no problem whatsoever for solving this problem. So this is known as a tracking problem and uh, tracking is used across a wide range of industries, particularly an embedded system. So if you have a line following robot, it's a tracking problem because the robot has to follow a line very closely. So a line following robot, you can, as long as there are no actuator saturation, so remember this UT star takes values in Rn. So as long as there is no actuator saturation, you can use Riccati equation to build a line following robot, which is probably something that every ECE student does at some point of time in their life, right? Any questions so far? The most attractive property here is LQR problem gives you linear control policy and a quadratic value function. And therefore, in order to store the policy in computer, you just have to store KT and in, in order to store value function in the computer, you only have to store ST, okay? You had a question? Yeah. Uh, Q, Q and QT plus one. Right. Q in the original, uh, in the running cost is a fixed. Matrix. matrix, yeah. It doesn't evolve. It doesn't evolve. So QT plus one is a different? Yeah, you just, you can also evolve these matrices, that's fine. I just didn't do it because I'll have to write too many, too many uh, expressions. But I wanted to keep the terminal Q separate because I wanted to make the connection with this ST and QT plus one and so on. So in reality, you can even change AT, VT, QT, RT, QT plus one. You just have too many subscripts to keep track of. 
in the expression. And also the terminal Q can be just Q. Right, it can also be just Q, yeah. You just want the terminal QT plus one to also be positive definite, a semi-definite. So all of these have to be positive semi-definite. Okay, any questions so far? So if you look at modern generators, wind farms, or, or any of these uh, sophisticated control system, you will have embedded microcontrollers in those sophisticated control systems. All of those embedded microcontrollers would be solving some equation of this type to, to, uh, to closely follow the optimal trajectory that is uh, directed to that particular subsystem. So it's actually very useful in a wide variety of uh, real world systems because this whole thing can be executed on a microcontroller. It doesn't require too much memory. Okay. Let's move on to a different problem. So, so one thing that you will have to do in your, in your uh, assignment is just apply the principle of mathematical induction to show the same result at every point of time t. Oh. If there are no questions, I'll talk about the resource allocation problem now. So I'm going to talk about a very simple resource allocation problem. Xt plus one equals to Xt minus Ut. These are all in real line, so it's just uh, one resource. And Ut is your consumption, Xt is the current resource level, Ut is the consumption, so you can only consume the resource. And then Ct of xt ut equals to minus log of ut and c capital t of xt plus 1 equals to minus log of xt plus 1. Let me put a constant c here. So what this is trying to say is, I have some initial resource, so let's say I'm retired. Well, retirement is maybe a bad example. Uh, let me give you another example. So suppose I have X, so I, 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 I'm in mining industry, and I came to California, and I saw that there is a gold mine in California, okay? And there is X naught amount of gold today. Okay, that's the initial amount of gold that was there in that particular mine. And every year or every day, I have to figure out how much gold should I extract from that particular mine. So UT is the amount of gold I want to extract from that mine. And I can extract a little bit of gold every day, or I could extract all the gold in one day, go and sell it in the market and earn a lot of money, right? But the problem is, if I take out too little gold, I'll have very little money, but I'll sustain for a very long time. And if I take out a lot of gold, I'll have a lot of money today, 
but I cannot eat that much amount of food. Like, you know, if, if, I, if I extract gold worth a million dollars today, I cannot really consume a million dollars today, right? It's, it's very difficult to consume that much amount of wealth. <laughs> for me, it's difficult to consume. Maybe for some people, it's not that difficult to consume a million dollars a day. Okay, so I cannot consume too much. So my consumption actually saturates at some point of time. The benefit I get from consumption saturates at some point of time. And that's why you see this log term. So my reward is log of ut. So my cost is negative of reward. So that's why I have negative of log of ut. Now, you could have a different problem where you add 1 plus the interest rate here if you are talking about retirement, because in retirement, you will put some money in your savings account or in your, in your interest-bearing account. So you will, you will get some interest on the money that you have put in the account, but you are also taking out some money and paying for your personal expenses. So that's, uh, there should be an interest rate here in case you want to talk about resource allocation in retirement. Okay, so all of these problems were formulated back in 1933 in the context of some economic uh, problems, particularly mining problems. <clears throat> so the question is, having, having uh, some terminal cost and some running cost, the question is how much, how much uh, amount should we mine on a day-to-day -day basis in order to minimize this total cost? And once again, I want to use dynamic programming. So I'll start with the terminal cost, Vt plus 1. Oh, the other thing is, in this case, there is a special condition that my ut has to be less than or equal to xt, and it has to be greater than or equal to 0. I cannot extract more than what I have, and I can only extract a non-negative amount of resource from the mine. So Vt plus 1 will be the same as Ct plus 1, so minus C log of Xt plus 1. Now I need to compute the optimi I, I need to write the optimization problem at time t. So can someone tell me what the optimization problem is? What should I write here? You want to try? Minus, <coughs> minus log Vt uh, minus C log Xt minus Vt. Perfect, thank you. Oh, U capital T. How do I solve this problem? Is this a convex problem in this region? Let's look at minus log of ut. What does it look like? So when ut is 0, minus log of 0 is plus infinity. When ut is 1, minus log of 0 is, minus log of 1 is 0. And then when ut is greater than 1, then it's less than 0. So this curve looks like 
this thing. This is minus log of ut. This is as a function of ut. Does this look like a convex function? It looks like a convex function. So actually, it is a convex function. If you take the second derivative, it is non-negative. So it's a convex function. What about this term? Minus c of log of xt minus ut. So this one, when ut equals to 0, minus c of log xt, it's some negative value. And when ut equals to xt, then it actually goes to infinity. So this one looks something like this. And this is your xt. Does this look like a convex function? This is minus c log xt minus ut. Does that look like a convex function? So this one is also convex. This is sum of two convex functions, so therefore it's convex. So what should I do? The other thing you will notice is actually ut, which is this point, ut star, it lies between 0 and xt. This is my 0, this is xt, and ut star lies somewhere in between. Which means that here it's a constrained optimization problem, but I can actually remove the constraints and just solve for the optimal solution because I know that the optimal solution is in the interior of the set, it's not at the boundary, okay? So let's look at, let's take the first derivative and try to solve for the optimal solution here. I'm going to erase this side. What's the first derivative? Minus 1 over ut plus c over xt minus ut at the optimal point is equal to 0. What is the value of u star t? Somebody should be able to solve this problem, right? Not that difficult, yeah. Xt over c plus 1. That's right. 1 over c plus 1 xt. So once again, we see that the optimal strategy or optimal policy here is a linear function of xt. OK, so the policy, in order to store the policy, all I have to store is this 1 over c plus 1 term. That's it. Now let's look at the value, v of t. This is minus log u star t minus c log xt minus u star t. Can someone tell me what this value looks like? Let me write down the first term. Who wants to simplify this?
can someone come up with a simplification for this value function? No? Let's, let's try it. Minus log xt minus log 1 over c plus 1 minus c log c over c plus 1 minus c log xt. What does this give me? Minus 1 plus c log xt minus, I have these two terms, log of 1 over c plus 1, so this is log c plus 1, and this is c log c plus 1. So c plus 1 log c plus 1 and then minus c log c. And this is a constant. Okay. Anything that you notice which is similar to the previous problem? So what similarity do we notice? So the optimal policy is a linear function of xt similar to the previous case. The second thing we notice is if you look at the value function it is something multiplied by log of xt, something multiplied by log of xt, plus some constant. And as we all know in optimization, constants don't matter, right? Constants can be whatever, it doesn't really affect the optimal policy. It just affects the optimal value. So as you start doing the dynamic programming, you go back one step and recompute the solution, you will figure out that your policy is always going to be linear in xt, and your optimal value is always going to be some multiplica multiplication factor times log of xt plus some constant term that doesn't depend on x at all. Okay, so this is another situation where dynamic programming gives you a closed form solution. And this, is a, this has been studied back in 1930s for resource allocation over long periods of time. And of course, there are multiple variations now. You can have interest rates here where the resource is in increasing. Um, you can even apply it for climate change type problems. So how much land should you use for agriculture and how much should you leave for just uh, letting the forest grow and things like that. So whenever you have a resource that is finite, at the beginning, so x0 is finite, x0 is in R, x0 greater than zero. So whenever you have a finite resource and you want to allocate it over long periods of time, where you have diminishing returns for, um, for your actions, then you, this is a very good model where you can compute what the optimal solution should look like over long periods of time. Okay, now one thing that we noticed here, but we sort of brushed, uh, like we didn't really consider it that much, was the fact that here the, the action has a constraint, ut is less than or equal to xt, right? So we didn't really consider the constraint here because 
because we knew that ut is actually in the interior of the set, so it's not at the boundary, so I don't have to use uh, any complicated optimization algorithm to solve it. But what happens when you do have these constraints, how do you solve dynamic programming equations in those situations? So that's the problem we will talk about in the next class. How do you solve dynamic programming when you have state action constraints? And these constraints are typically quite uh, important in many practical problems. So for instance, you're driving your vehicle, then your velocity, or, or you have to maintain some distance with the vehicle in front. So your actions have to respect those constraints at every point of time. And so you always have state dependent action constraints in dynamic optimization problems. And so we are going to study how to solve, solve dynamic programs for those situations. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about numerical simulations for uh, numerical methods for solving that simple dynamic programs where your state space is like one dimensional or two dimensional. And then in, that is going to be the next class, which is the Thanksgiving week on Monday. On Wednesday, there is no class. And then in the next week, which is after Thanksgiving, we'll talk about approximate dynamic programming, where if you have states that are like five dimensional, 10 dimensional, and so on, how do you solve those problems, okay? And those are like very important class of problems. Uh, for your, like just for your information, uh, over the last one year, we have been solving a dynamic optimization problem where the state is 200 dimensional and the action is 100 dimensional, okay? So in those cases, how do you solve such complicated dynamic optimization problems? So those are the kind of things that we'll talk about on in the week after Thanksgiving. And yeah, that's like maybe four classes more. Uh, we only have like four or five classes after Thanksgiving, so we'll focus exclusively on approximate dynamic programming in those classes. So thank you for your attention. See you on Monday. Have a great weekend.